looks so good. <laughs> Church looks so good. I love this time of year. This is my favorite time of year. I don't want it to ever end. Want to know why? Because, well, because of how everyone acts and all the good food and everything looks so good. And to be honest, it's because of the smells of this time of year. Yeah. Is there, when I say smells, what do you think I'm talking about? <laughs> Somebody said snow. Yes. Hmm? Yeah. Christmas trees? Yes! <laughs> yes, Christmas trees. I love the smell of Christmas trees. Cinnamon. Yes. So, <clears throat> so um, I brought something. And you tell me if you think this smells good. I'm not going to trick you. <laughs> Some people might try to trick you, but in this case, no. I'm super serious about how good this smells. So this says it is apple cinnamon. See if that smells like apple cinnamon. Mm, it smells like maybe. rotten pumpkin. <gasps> That's terrible. <laughs> That's not what it says on the label. <laughs> Does it smell like candy apple? What do you think it smells like? Like apple? You think it smells like apple? Oh, apple. It smells like apple. You gonna smell Clayton? See. Does it smell good? <laughs> okay, well, how about this one? Let's try something different. Ooh, this is like oranges. Who likes oranges? I don't Smell oranges. I don't like it. I don't like it. I love oranges. Oh, it's oh, sour lemon. What does that smell like? Rotten pumpkin? No. No. Does this smell like oranges? No. You want to smell? Like extra sour lemon. Is that oranges? Your is not lemon. It's sour lemon. It smells yes. fresh, yes. don't it? I like it. I like oranges. It's sour lemon. Does it smell good? Okay. What about, let's see. Here's another. Nope. What is that? Hey. We that Wait a minute. One. Now, <clears throat> this one says pumpkin spice. Uh, my, my see if that smells like good. Or if it smells like rotten pumpkin. Share. Share, share. If you don't want to smell, pass it on, please. It smells like what? Good pumpkins. good pumpkins. Okay, I found one that you like that smells like good pumpkins. You don't like that? Well, let me ask you this. Does anybody have at your house during Christmas time or the holidays or Thanksgiving, does anybody like candles at the house? Does it smell really good? Yes. <laughs> You can't stop. I can't try to keep it. <laughs> huh? He can't what? Oh, it's okay. It's okay. He can. He can. He can after church. We'll let him do that after church. Okay. That that that. This is one of my favorite time of years because the house smells. Everything smells good to me. And I wanted to share a verse with you about things that smell good. Did you know that there's something in the Bible about things that smell good? Wait, like orange? Maybe, yes. Like pumpkins? Like, pumpkins, like, like pumpkins. sugar cookies? Like gingerbread? Gingerbread. Okay, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 2, two it says... And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. And I have that scripture at my um, station where I work. And so I read it every day. And I got to thinking about it this week about what does that mean, God? What, when you say sweet smelling savior, savior, saber, 
What does that mean? So when you savor something, you want to remember everything about that moment, about what's happening. Like this is my favorite part of the week when I get to see y'all and be with my Christian family. And I want to savor that moment. I don't want it to end because I feel so good and the Spirit's here with us. and We're just having a great time. But a sweet-smelling savor. I asked the Lord, I was like, when you, when you talk about how we love like Christ's love, and he gave himself for us, what does it mean to you when you say for a sweet-smelling savor? And to me, he just said, Vivangie, what smells good to you? And I thought, well, Christmas, the smell of Christmas. It makes me feel good. I love it. He said, when you love people and others like Christ loves people, it smells like Christmas to me all the time. It smells so good. It makes me so happy. And I don't want that to ever end. And that's what God was telling me this week about this verse. When we, what does it say? When we walk in love Never. as Christ hmm? <laughs> has loved us and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. That tells me when I love and sacrifice and obey and do what God asks me to do, especially this time of year, we have a, a great opportunity to share Christ with others this Christmas. And when we do that, it smells like pumpkin spice, <laughs> a good, sweet-smelling savor to the Lord. And I want you all to remember that. When you do something good and you honor Christ, and this, this is encouraging me. That's why I'm telling you. <laughs> when I do something for the Lord, he says, oh, it smells so good. It smells like Christmas to me. And I want you all to think of that when you do something for the Lord this week and all the time and during this whole season. Okay, and we'll ask the pastor to pray for us and help us to do that. Lord, I pray that you help us to love others, to love you, and to do this favor to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Ephesians chapter 5 again today. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, we'll start in verse 13 this morning. Paul says, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word today. We've been here in the fifth chapter of Ephesians for a couple of weeks now, and we've been talking about what it means and what it takes to be a follower of of God. That is what Paul urges us to do in the first verse of this chapter when he says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Now it may have come to somebody's uh, thoughts that, well, what's the big deal about being a follower of God? Why does that really matter? As long as I'm a child of God, isn't that really the most important thing? Yes, it is. Well, here's the thing when it comes to 
being a follower of God or not being a follower of God. And the truth is, we're all following somebody. Whether we know it or not, whether we admit it or not, we're all following somebody. I know that there are some who would disagree with that. They'd say, not me. Oh, no. I'm my own man or I'm my own woman. I am not a follower. I am a leader. I blaze my own trail. Sure you do. Truth is, we're following somebody. And there's really only two choices for who we follow. We can do as Paul urges us to do here in this chapter, and we can choose to follow God. We can be one of his followers. That's the best choice. That's the good choice. That's the wise choice. The only other choice is to follow this world. It is to follow the crowd. So you're either following God today, or you're following the crowd. Uh, There's only two paths to go by as we make our way through this life. Either we are traveling the straight and narrow way that leads to life, or we are on the broad way that leads to destruction. So that's why it matters, and that's why it's important that we are a follower of God. And we've been talking about what it takes and what it means. And Paul's laying that out for us here in this chapter. He's given us the do's and the don'ts. Because that's what being a follower of God is all about. It's all about what we do and what we don't do. It is how we live our lives. It is how we conduct ourselves. It is the character that we have. It is our walk. Not so much our talk, our speech, and what we say. What we claim to be is not nearly so as important as how we live, what we do and what we don't do. And we've been looking at those things. And the last thing we looked at last week uh, is that we need to be acceptable to the Lord. If we're going to be a follower of God, in verse 10, Paul says, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. That should be our utmost desire. And that should be our greatest concern in life. Or it not be anything we're more concerned about than this. Not, or not be anything that's more important to us than this, that we would be acceptable to the Lord and that we would live in a way that is acceptable to Him. And we said we've got somebody to help us do that, somebody to help us figure out what that is, what is acceptable and what is not. And that is, of course, the Holy Spirit. If we're saved today, then the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. Thank God He does, that He dwells within us. But He's not there just to hang out and to accompany us through this life. No, He is there to help us. He is there to play an active role in our lives. And one of the ways that He helps us is this, helping us to know, is this acceptable to the Lord or is it not? He asks three questions every time. Uh, We saw that uh, Back up there in verse 9, he says, is it good? Is this good for us will it, or will it harm us and hurt us in some way? Is this going to benefit us spiritually? Uh, is it right? Righteousness. He wants to know, is this right for me? Does it fit in accordance with God's will for my life? Will it help me to be right with God? Because that's what righteousness is is after all it is the state of being right with God and then he also says is it true being the spirit of truth himself you can rest assured the Holy Spirit will never lead us to anything other than that which is true he'll never lead us to that which is false God does not want his people to believe a lie he does not want us to be deceived and so the Holy Spirit will always lead us To the truth. All right? Then in verse 11, we saw that led to having no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. And no means none. None whatsoever. Zero. Not even a little bit every once in a while. God's made it clear we are not to take part in the works of darkness. To have no fellowship with them. But now notice he did not say have no fellowship with the workers of darkness. 
Because if we don't have anything to do with lost people, if we say we're just going to totally stay away from them, how will they ever see the light? How are they ever supposed to know that God loves them and God cares for them? So yes, we are to fellowship with them, just not with the works that they do. In the last part of verse 11, he said, but rather reprove them. So Paul didn't just say stay away from them, avoid them. He said we're also to reprove them, to reprimand them. That's what that means. So we have a divine duty. We have a God-given responsibility to speak up and to take a stand and say, you know, that's wrong. That's not right. What you're doing is not acceptable to the Lord. It is a sin in His eyes and according to His Word. Not only do we have a divine duty and a God-given responsibility to do that, but we have the right to do that because it comes from God. He gives us the authority to do such a thing, to reprove uh, those things that are wrong. And even though there are some things that they have told us that we can't talk about anymore, things that are off limits, that you cannot question in any way. The last thing I'll say on this to you is you might want to ask yourself, well, why? Why can't we talk about that? Why can't we question that? Is there a reason that we can't, that we're not supposed to? You might want to wonder, well, what are they hiding? What's behind it all? Folks, God gave us a brain, and he gave us common sense. Well, most of us, anyhow. <clears throat> and we should use them. He wants us to use them. All right, let's go on from there then. You see, the next thing that is involved in being a follower of God, and that's in verse 14. He says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and rise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. The next thing that we have to do to be a follower of God, Paul says, is we need to be awake, and we need to be alive. You might think that goes without saying, but I think it's really important for you and me today. Because I am convinced that the greatest need of the church in our day and also the greatest need of this church, our church, New Hope Baptist Church in our day, is revival. There is nothing that we need more than for God to send a genuine spiritual awakening to you and I. To bring us back to life. Because I'm convinced that there's a good portion of God's people who are asleep today, who are asleep on God, who are asleep spiritually, and they probably don't even know it. Because it's kind of like being physically asleep in a way. When you lay down in your bed at night and you fall asleep, you're probably not laying there thinking, I'm asleep. I'm really glad I'm asleep. It's so good to be asleep. You're probably not thinking that. You're probably having a nice little dream, right? You're not aware of the fact that you are asleep. Well, the same can happen to us spiritually. We can be asleep and not even know it, not even really be aware of it. And if that goes on long enough, if we remain asleep spiritually, for a long enough period of time, then we can become like we're spiritually dead. Look at what he says. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead. Now don't misunderstand me. We are not talking about being spiritually dead in the sense of being lost. Because that is not possible if you are saved. I fully believe in eternal security. That the Bible teaches eternal security. So once you are saved, my friend, you are always saved. Once you belong to God, you will always 
belong to God. There is nothing that you or anyone else can do to change that. No matter how much you sin, no matter how bad you mess up, no matter how far you may wander from God, if you're saved, you're always saved. So we're talking about being spiritually dead in the sense of having some of the characteristics of being dead, like physically dead. What are some of those? Number one, there's no movement. When something dies, it stops moving. Have you noticed that? It does. It just kind of lays there, all quiet and still. There's no movement. And so if there's no movement in our life, if there's no movement in our church, then that could be a sign that we are spiritually dead. If the Holy Spirit's not moving, if we're not moving, then where are we? And I would ask you this morning, when's the last time you moved spiritually? Let me tell you what I'm talking about. When's the last time you came to God's house and you sat there and you listened to God's word, you heard the message being preached, and you felt moved. You felt the Holy Spirit moving inside you, convicting you even, letting you know you need to move today. You need to move up. By that, you need to respond when the altar call is given. And you actually got up and walked down the aisle and knelt in this altar or some altar somewhere and truly did business with God. When's the last time that happened? Or when people stop moving in a church in general. The altar calls given and God's people don't use God's altar. They don't move. Folks, that's not a sign of life. That's not a sign of spiritual health. It's a sign of death, of being spiritually dead. So there's no movement and there's no growth. Something's dead, it stops growing. No longer increases in size or strength. And in fact, the opposite begins to take place. It begins to decrease in size and in strength. It starts to deteriorate. It begins to dwindle. If that's happening in our life as an individual believer, or if that's happening in our church as a whole, it could very well be a sign of being spiritually dead. There's no movement, there's no growth, and there's no activity. Something dies, nothing's going on. Nothing's happening. Again, like we said before, it just lays there, all quiet and still. So if there's nothing going on, there's nothing happening, there's no real activity. And by that I mean there's no ministry being done. There's no service being carried out. There's no work being done for the glory of God. Again, that's a sign that we may be spiritually dead. And we need to awake and rise. Put another way, Paul's saying, wake up and get up. It's high time we do that, that we wake up from sleep and we get to work for God. Right? To be a follower of God, we must do that. Be awake and alive. All right? Verse 15. He says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. There it is again. Walk, walk, walk. He keeps coming back to that. And that's not an accident. He is doing this on purpose. Because it is all about our walk. It is all about what we do and what we don't do. It is about how I live my life. Not, it's not about our, our talk. 
our speech and what we say, what we may claim to the contrary. It's all about what we do and we don't do. And so he's already told us to walk in love. That was read to us today back up in the second verse. He's told us to walk his light. And now here in verse 15, he tells us to walk carefully and wisely. We'll get to the wisely part in a couple of verses. But for this verse, let's just focus on that first part where he said, Walk carefully. Because that's what circumspectly means. So he's telling us that when it comes to following God and in our walk with God, we need to watch every step that we take. We need to pay attention. Because mistakes are made and accidents take place when we get careless. When we let our guard down. When we don't pay attention. Just like being out here on the road, driving down the highway. When do we get in trouble? When do wrecks occur? It's when we get distracted. It's when we start focusing on something else. Our focus and our attention goes elsewhere. We're not watching where we're going. We're not watching what we're doing. And we're not watching what others around us are doing. That's when problems come. And so it is in our walk with God. When we don't pay attention, when we don't watch where we're going and what we're doing and what's going on around us, we get ourselves in trouble. Paul said, see then that ye walk circumspectly. And then he goes on in verse 16. He says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now I think we all know what a precious thing time is. That we, none of us want to waste it. Right? We want to make the most of every moment. And the reason that time is so precious is because the main thing about time and the most obvious thing about time is that it is limited. There's only so much of it. We do not have a never-ending supply of time. There are only 60 minutes in an hour. There are only 24 hours in a day. There are only seven days in a week. Time is extremely limited. And so it is for us too. You see, our time is limited. Every one of us has a start date, a begin date. I'm talking about our birthday. The day that we were born, the day that we first came into this world, that was our start date. And just like we all have a start date, we all also have an end date as well. And no one knows when that is, but it is appointed. It is absolutely appointed. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. All right, so you have a start date, and you have an end date. The day that you're going to leave this world, the day that our life here will be over. And the time between those two dates is all we have. That's it. There is no more. There's no more than 60 minutes in an hour, no more than 24 hours in a day, and there's no more time between our dates. None of us can turn back the clock. Say, I'm going to go back and make up for all that time that I've lost. Can't do that. Nor can we store time up and try to save it for later. That doesn't work either. Once a day passes, it is gone forever. It's never coming back. There are no do-overs. So do we really understand the importance of a moment? And do we appreciate the value of it? 
And more to the point, do we really understand the importance of this moment? And do we really appreciate the value that it may hold for us today? Because you see, here's something we need to understand. Paul wasn't just talking about time in general here. He did not say redeeming time because the days are evil. No, he said redeeming the time. Because the days are evil. So he's talking about a specific portion of time. And this Greek word that is translated the time here in verse 16 is translated opportunity in the book of Galatians. So Paul could just as well have been saying redeeming the opportunity because it's the same thing. It's the same word. And so what he is really saying to you and me, yes, time is precious. Yes, time is limited. Don't waste any of it. But he is talking about those moments that God brings us to. Like this one. He's talking about those situations that God puts us in. Like this one. And so do we really understand how important those are. And do we really value those moments? Because those are the moments when we have an opportunity. We have the opportunity to do something. To do something good. To do something for God. To do something that will serve Him, that will glorify Him, and that will help someone else. Oh, as precious as time is. And how we don't want to waste any of it. The time is even more so. Even more precious. And we certainly don't want to waste any of that. The last part of that verse he said, because the days are evil. I think we'd all agree with that. That we're living in wicked times. These are evil days. And that could be a discouragement to you and me. That could make us not want to redeem the time, not want to make the most of the opportunities that God gives us because we'd look around and we see how bad things are and we might conclude, well, what's the point? What's the use? Why bother? I might as well just forget it and give up. It could really discourage us. Paul is saying, don't let it discourage you. Let it have the opposite effect. Let it encourage us. Seeing how wicked these days are, let us be even more determined, even more uh, resolved that we are going to make the most of the time. The time that God has given to us, the opportunities He has presented us with, just like this one. Lord, we come to you today thanking you, praising you for all that you have done for us. Lord, that you have given us a way to go. You've given us a way to be. And that is to follow you. Lord, I want to pray for me today. And I want to pray for my fellow brethren, the other members of this congregation. Because Lord, I believe that you have presented us with the time. It's not time that we deserve or that we've merited. But it's time we need. It is an opportunity, Lord, that I believe you've sent our way that you presented us with right now. For we have the opportunity to do something for you. To be moved again. Maybe for the first time in a very long time. You hope could be moved today. Oh, how I'd love to see that. How our hearts would rejoice. God, to see that take place. Where you're giving us the opportunity to awake, 
to arise. God, I pray with all that is within me is that we will not let this opportunity pass us by. That we will make the most of it. We will take advantage of it right here, right now. Just the way you would have us to. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll stay. going on in here? Anything? Is there any activity? Any movement at all? If you feel like there is, I would urge you, don't pass, let that pass you by today. Don't let that slip away. Because the more we do, the less that's likely to happen. Because our heart can get a little harder, a little harder each time we do. If you feel like God's telling you to move today, please move. Don't wait on somebody else. You don't need somebody else to go first, to take your place. This is between you and the Lord. It's between us and the Lord. I came on business for the King today. And I pray His business will be done now. But that's up to all of us. You know you need to? What are you waiting for? Let God have his way with you. In the throne room of my Savior, I find a sweet relief. I'll find strength to bear my burdens. I'll find comfort for my grief. And when my cup is overflowing, when he fills it to the rim, what a blessed consolation. I can bring it all to him. I'll just bring it all to him. When no one understands, when you're looking for an answer, God always has a plan, and when the burdens get so heavy, and my sight is getting dim, oh how sweet it is, and knowing I can bring it all to Him, if you'll just bring it all to Him, when no one understands when you're looking for an answer. God always has a plan. And when the burdens get so heavy and my sight is getting dim, oh, how sweet it is in knowing I can bring it all.
praise God for that. Did you redeem the time today? Did you make the most of your opportunity that God gave you? I sincerely hope so. What's that? true.